everybody. Welcome back to the Rupa Subramania show. Last week, the Public Service Alliance of Canada unions representing 155,000 workers went on strike. The timing couldn't have been worse for most Canadians as the tax filing season, tax filing deadline is coming up and processing of returns could be delayed. Even more, processing of passports and other services will be delayed and only emergency cases will be considered. Over the weekend, the union leadership announced that they would also be moving their pickets uh, towards sensitive areas like ports, making it clear that they would need to have an effect on the Canadian economy to make their voices heard. To talk about PSAC's strike, I'm joined by Franco Terrazano of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, an advocacy group that stands for lower taxes and more accountable government. Welcome to the show, Franco. It's great to have you here. Um, at the time of recording, uh, the PSAC strike um, has been going on for just under a week. Uh, it's been extremely disruptive. Uh, it's affected all of us in one shape or the other. Um, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation um, is not supportive of the strike action. Can you can you tell us why? Yeah, well, look, I don't think many Canadians are going to be supportive of this. And I, and I don't think there's too many Canadians out there, especially in the private sector, especially outside of the Ottawa bubble, that feel sorry for these bureaucrats. Let's call it what it is. They're privileged. They took pay raises during the pandemic. They never worried about losing their jobs. And now they want to take billions more from their neighbors, from fellow Canadian taxpayers who are worried about mortgage payments going through the roof, who are trying to afford the price of gasoline or the price of groceries. Um, now, here's what the Peace Act is pushing for. They want up to a 47% compensation increase over three years. Folks, up to 47% compensation increase over three years. And that would cost taxpayers $9.3 billion. So they've already taken pay raises. They were never worried about losing their job. And now they want billions more from taxpayers. Yeah, uh, that, I mean, I was going to jump into, that was going to be my next question. What what are their demands? What what exactly makes their demands egregious? I think there's, they're also uh, calling for a whole bunch of non-wage benefits. I wonder if you could go into, uh, you know, just a, apart from what you've already pointed out, wh wh what are the other more uh, crazy demands that PSAC is making? Yeah, so you probably heard the up to 47% compensation increase. Like that is that is crazy. <laughs> that's pushing for Pluto. And the reason that it gets up so big is because that's talking about pay and benefits. And some of the benefits, if we went up to our boss and, and asked for what they're asking, we'd get laughed out of the room. Okay, here's some of the non-wage benefits that they're pushing for. They want to be paid more to work past 4 p.m. Okay, now what do most people call working past 4 p.m.? A normal day. They want to get paid more for working past 4 p.m. Here mm. might be the most uh, egregious demand. They want taxpayer-funded contributions into a union-controlled social justice fund. Mm. Um, mm. And that's what they use to engage in advocacy for progressive public policy. Now, I wasn't even aware about the social justice fund until we dived into the list of their demands. But they've been using the social justice fund to send members to climate conferences in Madrid or Cancun. They've even used it to... Uh, produce a report which in part advocates for higher business taxes. Now, yeah. I believe Canadians have a right to advocate on issues they feel important, but they shouldn't be using government negotiations to take money from taxpayers to fund their advocacy. I know I'm rambling, but there's a couple more ones I really want to get across. So they're also pushing for an education fund of up to $17,000 for laid off members. They want more paid time off of up to two weeks a year. They want four weeks of vacation after only working for four years. And they want overtime paid a double time. So it's not just the wages that they're asking for. When you include these non-wage benefits, you're looking at up to 47% compensation increase over three years. Hmm. Um, anyone watching uh, TV or like anyone keeping up with what's happening in the news will be aware that the union is trying to portray itself as average Canadians who are fighting for their rights. Uh, but PSAC workers are hardly average Canadians. They have uh, more generous pay and benefit packages, I would say, than any other unionized, uh, any other unionized Canadians out there and way better than many who labor in the private sector with uh, little or no benefits. Um, I know you said that most Canadians pro probably don't support this, but according to a recent poll by Angus Reid, uh, it turns out most Canadians 
are supportive of peace act strike action um, and this is even more so uh, when it comes to liberal and NDP voters uh, why do you think I, I most Canadians are supportive of the strike action even though it's so incredibly disruptive well if we're talking about the same poll yeah. most Canadians did not support the wage increase demands okay and that was just the percentage of wage increase that they're demanding if you included all the other compensation, and if they said they're pushing for up to 47% over three years, by mm -hmm. the way, folks, that was from the Treasury Board of Canada Secretariat. It was confirmed in the Public Interest Commission report. At least it wasn't, uh, there was no opposition against that number in the in the final uh, writings. I think even more Canadians would have opposed the wage. So the the poll that I saw showed that the majority of Canadians, or at least less than a majority of Canadians supported um, their wage ask. But let's just look at the bureaucracy in total, because a lot of the numbers are, are, are a high level snapshot of the bureaucracy. Well, the parliamentary budget officer is the government's own independent budget watchdog. It's not a union group. It's not a taxpayers group. It's a nonpartisan uh, government authority. Mm -hmm. And it says that the average compensation of a federal government employee, when you look at the pay, the benefits like pensions, uh, premiums, things of that nature, is $125,000 a year. $125,000 a year, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a Fraser Institute report just showed that government employees make about eight and a half percent more than their counterparts working in the private sector. So you have people who work less, but are paid more, demanding more money from the taxpayers who make less and struggle more. So it's completely unfair what's going on. And this is why I say, I don't think many Canadians have much sympathy for the privileged bureaucrats who took pay raises during the pandemic when everyone else was struggling and who have never worried about losing their job. Hmm. I, and the strike comes, I, I would say, at a very embarrassing time for the prime minister. Uh, Justin Trudeau has always portrayed himself as a friend of the average working Canadian. Uh, yet uh, in the most recent scandal, um, question marks have been raised about his lavish Caribbean vacation paid for apparently by a rich friend and and a protracted strike uh, could be damaging for his liberal government. What do you think this strike means for Trudeau? Do you think he'll blink because he wants the strike to end soon or or, or do you think he'll hold firm? Yeah, well, you know, I don't have a uh, pundit hat, so it's, it's tough for me to go into the political analysis, yeah. but here's what a government should do. If a government was serious about this, this is what we should do, okay? So over the last two years, we saw the cost of the bureaucracy balloon by 31%. 31% over two years, okay? So here's what happened broadly. 312,000 federal government employees took at least one pay raise during the pandemic. More than 90% of the entire bureaucracy took at least one raise. The feds handed out $559 million in bonuses and it just hired 31,000 new employees. So taxpayers just paid for hundreds of thousands of pay raises, hundreds of millions in bonuses, and for tens of thousands of new employees. We just saw the bureaucracy balloon by 31%. So, so what a serious government would do would take a page from former Alberta Premier Ralph Klein. And what it would say is we're going to reduce the cost of the bureaucracy. Now, that could be through attrition, reducing the number of bureaucrats, benefit cuts, pay cuts, or a combination of each. But what a serious government would do would put the onus on the unions. Here is the budget. We're reducing the size and the cost. You figure it out. That's how a government should deal with this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, that sounds pretty reasonable to me. Um, you know, what makes their their demand, um, you, you know, what, what makes Peace Act's demand for Trudeau's ostensibly uh, progressive government is all of this pro progressive verbiage, which you uh, pointed to earlier. Uh, and one of the things is this training called uh, in unconscious bias, uh, which means that if someone, I'm thinking presumably someone who's white, doesn't think they're racist, you'll be trained to realize that you're actually a racist, uh, but you don't realize it. Um, I mean, this is just incredibly bizarre. Um, has this kind of, um, is this kind of n demand uh, during a strike, is that is that normal? Like I've, I, I'm hearing this for the first time. I've never heard of this before, but then again, I'm not a labor lawyer, so I don't have that type of background. But look, mm -hmm. if the union wants to push for the for certain types of benefits and they think that's the priority, then they should be forced to come to the table and find cuts somewhere else. Because from the taxpayer perspective, the yeah. union negotiators can't just be demanding more, more, more. 
That's not an adult conversation. Mm -hmm. And the government needs to actually push back, right? That's yeah. what needs to happen. Um, so let me even go one step further, okay? Because I haven't really heard much pushback from any of the parties. Now, to be fair, I have seen the opposition, the conservatives say, you know, how in the world do you increase the cost of the bureaucracy by so much and still have a strike? So I have mm -hmm. heard the, the conservatives take that line, but I haven't even heard any of the parties really come out against these demands from the government union negotiators. I haven't really heard a single member, and maybe I'm wrong, maybe I missed something, that's possible, but I haven't heard it yet. And one of the reasons for that, I believe, is because they just took their fourth pay raise, the politicians, since the beginning of the pandemic. So how can, it's very difficult for a member of parliament to then have the moral authority to push back against government union negotiators after they just stuffed their own pockets with four pay raises since the pandemic. And I, and I really didn't hear a single member of parliament host a press conference or do media uh, bashing the MP pay. Maybe, maybe they did. I didn't see it. So one of the issues that we're seeing now is that we should at least have one political party or some politicians speak out specifically against the government union negotiators. Maybe they have, but I haven't seen it, Rupa. Have you? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, but uh, I'm, you know, I, I, but I could have also missed missed something there, but uh, no, not to my knowledge. Um, you know, civil servants, these are civil servants, like many white collar workers have gotten used to working from home. Um, and this is one of their demands, right, to be able to work from home at least several days a week, um, rather than fully returning to the office as the government wants. Um, of course, this is also happening in the private sector, um, except that in the private sector, taxpayers are not on the hook. And it just seems kind of really strange when you put all of this in the context of the vaccine mandates, you know, where they were working from home, yet you had a vaccine mandate in place, uh, and now they want to continue working from home. Um, you know, how, how does, how does working from home look like for a civil servant? I mean, I don't know if you can weigh in on this. I mean, is there any kind of monitoring? They could just be goofing off on our dime. Well, I think that's the big question, right? Is there mm -hmm. an accountability mechanism? Because in the private mm -hmm. sector, there mm -hmm. is, right? The accountability mechanism of the market. If you are good at your job, you outcompete the competitors, you earn a profit. If you're bad, if you're not productive, you earn a loss. And then there's pressure all the way down through the business to make sure people are actually doing their job. Well, what's the same accountability mechanism in the government when they use taxpayers' money, not relying on the profit and loss mechanism of the market? So I think that's the big question, right? Because look, if government employees could show that uh, you could save money by having them work at home, having them be just as productive for taxpayers, right? Who should be presumably the customers, then I think you can have that conversation. Mm. But the issue is, if we're going to be paying them huge salaries and compensation, when you look at pay benefits, all of this kind of stuff, well, then how do we ensure that they are being productive? Because remember, we've heard from the PBO that government departments are barely meeting half of their own objectives. Now, that brings me to another point. A pay raise is supposed to be for when you do a good job. You shouldn't just get a pay raise just for showing up. So by what mechanism do these bureaucrats or these government union negotiators think that they're entitled to a pay raise? Yeah. And where do you where do you think that comes from? Well, I think it comes from the fact that it's just been business as usual. Right. I think that's where it is. I think it's an entitlement issue. And one of the issues is not just from the government union negotiators or the bureaucrats. It's also from the politicians, because at the end of the day. It's the members of parliament who are supposed to be presiding and watching over the public purse. Mm. But like I said, maybe we've seen some people be outspoken. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen members of parliament truly call out some of the outrageous demands coming from the union negotiators. And one, one demand is really striking to me, and it should be easy to be called out. And that's the social justice fund. Okay. I mean, even just take away the word social justice or advocating for progressive public policy, even set that aside, they shouldn't be using tax dollars to advocate for any type of public policy, right? If they want to advocate for public policy, they should pay for it with their own money. They shouldn't be forcing taxpayers to put contributions into the fund through these government negotiations. 
that's a very good point so uh it, but uh and but yet they're doing this which is which is really strange i mean um it, that essentially amounts to a public policy position right um and and but they're using taxpayers money to bring about what they think is an, you know the yeah, yeah. It, Even it, more to that, I've tweeted it out. So mm-hmm. we put a we put out a, um, a a an investigative story by investigative journalists of ours talking about the non wage benefits that they were demanding. I believe this was out a week ago or two weeks ago, and mm-hmm. included in this tweet thread, I I posted an a report mm-hmm. from the Social Justice Fund of PSAC that was l- literally advocating or musing about higher business taxes. Now, look, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation were very much on the record that taxes should be going down and we're very much against higher business taxes in Canada, of course, right? But look, a group, if they want to go out and fundraise with their own money, they can advocate for that, but they shouldn't be relying on taxpayers' money to advocate for whatever public policy that they want to do. That's just fundamentally wrong. Are there no rules against like, um, you know, you can't just make any demand, right? I mean, for it to ha- have some credibility, uh, your demands have to uh, be credible. Uh, you can't just ask for anything. You can't ask for the moon. You can't, um, you know, make make these strange demands because you're, ultimately your cause is not going to be credible at the end of the day. Um, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I don't know if you can weigh in on this. I mean, can you just ask for anything uh, and, and go on strike? Well, I don't know the legal aspects around this, right? Mm-hmm. But let me tell you a tactic that government unions like to do, right? So all of this is essentially negotiated behind closed doors for the most part, right? And to find what they're pushing for, you really have to do your research. You have to do your homework, right? But the Canadian Taxpayers Federation has. We got our hands on the demands list from from the PSAC. And that's why we were able to publish all of these. But it was like a 200 plus page document that we had to sift through to find mm-hmm. some of these demands. So essentially, right, because mo- usually this isn't open to the public, um, they're able to, 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 to push for some of these types of non-wage benefits that most people would get laughed out of the office if we mm-hmm. even brought up with our boss. And yeah. so that's why we're trying to show the public you know, just what they're demanding. Because I think for for most Canadians who are taxpayers, who are living outside of the Ottawa bubble, who are in the private sector, uh, who may be worried about a looming recession right around the corner, I think when most people find out about some of these demands and the fact that they're pushing for up to 47% compensation increase over three years, I think they that does sound like pushing for Pluto. That does sound mm. out of touch with reality. Yeah. How do you how do you think this uh, issue is going to play out? Who do you think will fold their hand first? Oh, that's a good question. I I, I really don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really our job at the Canadian Taxpayers Federation to uh, sound the alarm over this, to to push Canadians to contact their members of parliament or, or to contact the president of the Treasury Board, Mona Fortier, to tell her that enough is enough, to stand up for taxpayers. Um, but you know, let me just go back to another point here. The reason that these government union negotiators can even think about some of these demands is because of how reckless the Trudeau government has been with our finances, right? In, in, in a world where you had a serious government, a government serious about protecting taxpayers and protecting the public purse, there is no way government union negotiators can push for up to 47 compensation increase over three years, right? Like if the government was serious about the finances, it would be way tougher on these government union negotiators. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I know you said you're not a political pundit, but uh, can you maybe just tell us what you think uh, uh, about this? Do you think it'll be damaging for Trudeau in the next election or will the union have egg on its face, given that very few unionized Canadians uh, to say nothing of the non-unionized are getting wage increases, anything close to what they're demanding? Well, I do think that the broader perception of government employees isn't going to improve because of this, right? I mean, this is, we're talking about federal bureaucrats Mm. who received raises, who were never worried about losing their job, who are now striking, pushing for billions more from taxpayers who, in all honesty, struggled, right? Because, like, Rupa, you know, I think it's fair to say that everyone has struggled over the last couple of years. I, I, I think it's fair to say people are struggling now. And I, and, I, and I think it's fair to say that everyone is, is stressed. 
But the type of stress that a government employee who got to keep their job, who got to work from home, that type of stress is not the same type of stress felt by a small business owner, the gym, your restaurant down the street, who had to take out a line of credit just to keep the lights on. Those are two different types of stresses, right? At least financially. So I think the people who work in the private sector, the taxpayers, the ones who may have lost their job, took a cut, lost their business, I don't think they're going to have any sympathy for privileged striking bureaucrats who are demanding billions of dollars more. Yeah, well, on that note, Franco Terrazano, I uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but uh, it was great to have you on the show. And thank you for sharing with us uh, your insights. And I really hope that this strike comes to an end soon because there's so much work that needs to be done. And uh, and I, you know, I'm losing my patience for these um, self-entitled bureaucrats. <laughs> and <laughs> um, thank you so much for being on the show. And I hope to ha have you here again soon. Well, thanks for having me on.